So CPR, uh, Columbia Pathways to Recovery, which we fondly call CPR, began. Uh, it's a grassroots organization that is a Columbia County um, uh, RCO, Recovery Community Organization, and it grew out of a need for changes, for solutions, and for awareness and education about the uh, addiction um, opiate crisis that's going on in Columbia County. And um, CPR really tries hard to um, bring education about so that people can really understand that this is not um, just happening to, to other communities or to people who don't have education or have backgrounds or have solid families or, or have uh, jobs or, or come from um, some sort of a background that's not them. But it is us, it's all of us. And what drew me into drugs initially, because actually I was, a, I was a late bloomer, I didn't really try my first hard drug until I had graduated high school and moved out to California. Up until that point, I was a triathlete. I was in AP classes. I was, I was um, one of the fourth percentile of our class, you know, graduating and just, I was a good kid. Um, it wasn't like peer pressure. Um, you know, I was, <clears throat> when I got my hands on it, I took it uh, right then and there. And it was in school, um, second period, study hall. Uh, I was by myself. <laughs> and it's kind of like in the party. Uh, I've always been that kind of guy that enjoyed going out and have a good time. And uh, I started, started doing drugs and drinking when I was young, probably about 13. Uh, I first started off with Oxycontin. Uh, I never grew up wanting to use drugs or thinking that I would become dependent on drugs. I grew up in a household where I never saw my parents drink. Um, I never saw drug use. We talked about the risks of addiction and, you know, my biological father was an alcoholic, so I, I knew of alcoholism. I never... I never anticipated having a problem with it myself. And I snuck upstairs and took a bottle out of the liquor cabinet and brought it downstairs. And we drank that night in her basement. Her parents had no idea. And that first night that I drank, I drank until I blacked out. And after I did it that one time, the next time I was at a sleepover and they went to their parents' liquor cabinet and they brought a bottle down, I was okay with it. I thought it was fun and it was harmless and everyone was doing it and so I did it. Back to, to sniffing coke and taking ecstasy more often than I, I care to remember. We were, at one point we were going through seven eight hundred dollars of cocaine in a weekend, if not more, depending on how much money we had. So I mean we would, we would really party hardy. And I would hang out at somebody's house and be drinking, smoking crystal meth and she would have pills with various colors and we would be like, hey, let's just take a few of these. Um, we know they're controlled substances of some sort, so let's see what this combination does. And I just did a complete flip and... I it was normal, you know, maybe I was like just being a little bit rebellious, but I would never have said that I was addicted or that I had a drug problem. You know, when I could stop, I didn't want to stop. And then by the time I started to realize that there was something wrong, I couldn't stop. I was dependent. I was physically dependent, emotionally dependent, spiritually dependent on, on something to help me just get by. And I faced my first withdrawal from opiates at 17, a significant moment. And for a while I was fine. And then eventually at a party I found my drug of choice, my fix, my solution, you know. Um, it was Oxycontin and it was just a little bit, but it was the first time in my entire life that I can recall where I didn't hate myself. I, I education and awareness so that people can really understand that it's not just a matter of just say no or just don't do it. Um, if it were that easy, we would not be having the number of deaths that we continue to have. And um, 
and to bring some kind of a compassion to the picture so that people understand that these are people who are suffering and it's not a matter of choice anymore uh, once, the, uh, once, once the opiate takes hold and addiction occurs there is a real scientific chemical imbalance that happens in the brain that changes the, uh, the messages that the neurons are giving and it makes the opiate a source of survival for the person. It's an, ab it's an absolute necessity. It's problem like that I didn't think I could be. And when it really literally took me until I was licked, uh, the day that I surrendered and actually asked for help and accepted help, that was 15 years later. I, I was very much unconscious of the problem because I was functional, but inside I knew I would, you know, there was a part of me lying to myself saying that everything was all right. And the true moment of when I recognized I had a problem is when I asked for help. And that was 15, 20 years later than, you know, after I took the drug, because everybody- To really else... try and stop. And the moment that I was faced with that withdrawal and it, and I couldn't just make it go away instantly, the medication they'd give me wasn't working quick enough, or I, I just felt terrible, I would just sign myself out. I would sign myself out and I'd go get high again. So after doing that a few times and continuing my criminal behaviors to support my physical dependency, I eventually I couldn't even stay at home anymore. And I, I left and the criminal side of my addiction really progressed and I, um, I was on the run. I had charges out for me for, for things that I did in my use, um, and the authorities were looking for me, and I wasn't ready, willing, or able to stop using, so I had to do what I had to do to just be able to, to keep numbing myself, to keep, to keep running. I didn't realize heroin had been so easy to get in a powder form, because if I can sniff cocaine, I can sniff a pill, what's really the big difference in sniffing heroin? And uh, so I, I just used to lie to myself and say it was the same thing as sniffing a pill, and and I was just so wrong. <laughs> um, and I, I probably sniffed heroin for about three years, four years before I I realized that I could get much higher, much faster with a needle. Uh, my friends and I using heroin again, as if like I personified her heroin as a person. And I would say to people, for me to relapse, it would be the equivalent of me like hanging out with the man who killed my brother and saying, oh yeah, you killed my brother, but like we can still chill. We, we're still cool. Like that just doesn't make sense. Um, but I did. I ended up relapsing. You know, my brother died from a heroin overdose and I ended up relapsing. And um, in the beginning of this year, I tried to end my life by overdose in my car in upstate New York in a cold winter morning. Um, and by the grace of God, I, I, didn't, I didn't do it. I wasn't successful. I woke up. <laughs> Instead, I woke up really cold and confused and without any more drugs and without any more desire in me to fight. So I went to the one place that I knew no matter what I could still go. And I went home and um, The stigma, as I said, is a is an old one, and ideally, you know, the higher orders of thinking are assessing something that's a much lower functioning. The <clears throat> to have a moral judgment on addiction means that you're looking at it from an uninfluenced mind in the sense that you are not under the influence of the drug 
the behavior or whatever it might be. You have clarity of thought to be able to thinking as like, well, if you do this, then this happens. Why would you do that then? It, that makes logical sense. Now, if it made sense to drink poison every day, it's not, it's not logical. It's emotional. And you're speaking two different languages. You're speaking uh, one plus one equals two versus <clears throat> you, you, you're, you're, uh, we don't have much conscious um, opportunity to intervene over. You know, when, when we're locked and loaded, it's, it's very hard. It's like telling somebody to stop falling in love. That, that's, that's what you're trying to stop. That's the power of it. I'm part of an organization called CPR, Columbia Pathways to Recovery. Um, it's a 501c3. We're volunteers and we try to educate the community. We advocate. We have a, a, an education committee, an events committee, and a communications committee. And I'm part of the communications committee. committee and I have and I'm on. And I, I am part of incredible things today. I get to witness other people struggling and hurting and healing. And I've gotten the opportunity to watch entire communities galvanize behind the concept of recovery, of, of coming together, being connecting, connected and helping each other heal. And I've, I've been able to have the opportunity to be a normal contributing member of society. And I used to hate when people said that even, but now it's like I understand what they meant. It's not even that I was doing anything great, but I'm just not drawing the life out of anybody anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my family, my friends, they're, they're happy to see me now. People don't go the other way when they do see me. I'm allowed to go in people's houses. I have the keys. I mean, up until... What I am or who I was. But I felt that way so strongly that I, asking for help was not ever an option. It was never an option. Admitting that I had this problem wasn't an option. And I think that as faith-based communities, as churches, we have a great opportunity to help fix that, to change some of those stigmas associated with a brain disease. I, you know, my, my neurons were not firing in the right way. I had lower levels of important things in my brain, like serotonin and dopamine. So when I put a chemical into my body... do, which is still a miracle that they're clean, and I respect them for that. But I, if I could stop somebody so they can still have a full life ahead of them, is, is what I want to do. If I had Medicated is assistant treatment. There is smart meetings. There's 12-step there's meetings. There's... There's mental health and 12 sub meetings combined, you know, for people that understand that, you know, they're in a tiny town where so many people are dying and it's so unnecessary because there are so many pathways and that's why we chose to, to call it Columbia Pathways to Recovery because no one person is a stain. You know, contact CPR, contact the helpline, whoever you talk to on the helpline even if you're just looking for information, they're gonna treat you with compassion, respect, understanding, and love. Like, because when it comes down to it, like, I pick up that phone on the helpline and I don't know what you look like, I don't know anything about you. All I know is that you're calling this number right now because you want help in one way or another. And I'm gonna do everything in my power to give you what you need to either start you on your path to recovery or just give you information so that when you're ready for it, you know where to go.